Hi, I'm Stuart Taylor and I make videos about project management and productivity. If that's your thing, you should subscribe. But if you like project management and you like reading, well, good news, I have book recommendations. And if you like project management videos, reading and special guest superstar project management trainers, then Christmas has come early because Mike Clayton from Online PM Courses is here to give his recommendations too. Mike's been delivering high quality project management training on YouTube for about five years. His channel's often the first place that I go to if I'm looking for a clear explanation on some of the trickier project management methods. He regularly has guests on his channel that include some of the greatest minds in modern project management. So if you're a project manager, you really should be subscribed to his channel. The link is in the description. Now let me ask you, have you ever read a book that has nothing to do with project management and noticed how it has themes and lessons and information that's useful in project management? Well, that's happened to me a bunch of times and it's happened to Mike too. So we put our heads together to come up with a list of six non-project management books that we recommend for project managers. And whilst we were thinking about books, we also came up with six project management books for project managers, made a video and uploaded it to Mike's channel. The link's in the description and you can head there right after you've watched this video, all the way to the end. I'll hand over to Mike now for his first recommendation. My first recommendation is Reading the Room by David Cantor. Have you ever wondered what's going on in a room full of professionals in a project meeting where there's undercurrents and agendas? Have you ever wanted to be able to read the room? That's what this book is all about. The full title is Reading the Room, Group Dynamics for Coaches and Leaders. But don't be put off by the for coaches and leaders part of it. After all, every project manager is a leader. You need to be able to lead. And whilst this book is very full, very rich, very detailed, and takes a lot of study to master, just reading it once through will give you that sense that you are starting to understand and that there are patterns you can dive into. In this book, you'll learn about movers, followers, bystanders, and opposers. And you'll learn how the content of a discussion can have power, meaning, or affect. This book is not a quick read and mastering it is a big ask, but it is a thrilling read. And reading it through, I got the sense that I would be better equipped to understand and influence the group dynamics in the room and therefore effect some change in attitudes and decisions. My first recommendation is Mega Change, The World of 2050. The book's a set of predictions made about the future by economist writers in 2012. It's easy to look at such a book based on recent events that have attracted so much of our attention and wonder just how accurate it really can be. And you'll find it's got a few hits and a few misses, but the book doesn't focus on the near-term changes and instead looks further forward with insights on population and demographic changes the future of culture, migration and health, including pandemics, and what impacts they may have on the broader political landscape. It considers our responses to climate change, the growth of the state, the emergence of new markets and changes in faith and religion. It considers the impacts of new technologies, with changes that will come to the internet, the direction of science, the willingness to engage in further space exploration, and how the current tools of war will need to be replaced. Curiously, one of the later chapters is called Distance is Dead, Long Live Location. Tell me you haven't thought about similar things yourself or had similar discussions in the last couple of years. Why is any of this interesting to project managers? Because we work in change and our future career opportunities lie in change. So whilst the rest of the world can read this book as a curiosity, we can use it to plot a direction, especially if you're at the start of your career. Whether you see the forecast in the book as positives or negatives, you can at least position yourself to have the right skills and relevant experience just in case these forecasts prove to be accurate. Mega change will make you think about the future differently and your role as an active participant. Shackleton's Way by Margot Morell and Stephanie Caporell is absolutely my favourite book on leadership. Shackleton's Way tells the thrilling story 
of Ernest Shackleton's expeditions to the Antarctic. But each chapter highlights real practical leadership lessons that we can learn from Shackleton's way, the way that Shackleton led his teams. And to make it really easy, at the end of each chapter is a summary. But this book is more than a set of cliff notes for leadership. It tells the story through anecdotes and through reports and diary entries. And for me, when I first learned about Shackleton and I compared him in my mind to his close contemporary Robert Falk and Scott, I saw two very distinct styles of leadership, which really affected my perceptions of what leadership is. Scott had a single-minded determination to reach his goal, the South Pole, so much so that he was prepared to risk his own life and those of his men. And his leadership and charisma were such that his men were prepared to follow him to their death. Shackleton, on the other hand, faced equally and apparently insurmountable difficulties. But when he realized how much danger he and his men were in, he was far more agile in his thinking than Scott. While Scott stuck to his goal, Shackleton changed his goal on a tuppence. He turned around his goal and decided that his new goal was to ensure that every single member of his crew survived. And he succeeded. For me, this is what leadership is all about. Shackleton's way is about his relationship with each and every one of his followers, even the ones he found difficult and uncomfortable to be with. Much like Mike, I have an interest in how explorers and adventurers have tackled their challenges and applied the principles and tools of project management. It's interesting to reflect that in the decade where project management started to mature into an actual profession, its principles were already being applied in an amazing accomplishment of leadership, planning and goal setting. Everest 1953 is the story of the first successful ascent of Mount Everest. It features a lot of historical context with the last days of the British Empire, the coronation of Queen Elizabeth, the regional challenges caused by the recently formed Communist government of China, but also the race to be the first to conquer Everest in the face of competition from the Swiss and the French. The book covers an attempt in 1951, but the most interesting part for me was the perceived failure of an expedition in 1952 to the neighboring mountains in the Himalayas, as the Swiss team were the only ones granted permission to attempt Everest that year. The 1952 expedition exposed serious flaws in the leadership style and the planning that were rectified ahead of the successful 1953 expedition. But in the same way that we should, they learned from their lessons, they improved their planning, leadership and management and essentially, they tested and refined the best oxygen canister mixtures to get the right balance of weight to oxygen. The book references a number of letters and diary entries made by the men involved in the expeditions, and you get a real sense of the personalities, the strengths and weaknesses across the team. In an age where people now queue up to reach the top of Everest, it's nice to look back and be reminded that what is now considered to be difficult but achievable was once considered to be nearly impossible. Who knows which of the impossible things we're attempting today will be considered mundane in just a few years. I often argue that serious project managers need to read and learn about psychology. And this book, Methods of Persuasion by Nick Kalender, is steeped in psychology. I also say, and I'm far from alone in saying it, that project management is a people discipline. As a result, 80% of project management is about communication and leadership. And what more valuable communication skill is there in project management than the ability to persuade? Because we have to persuade our steering groups, our project boards, our sponsors, our stakeholders, our users, and our team members. Here is a book that is steeped in the psychology of persuasion. Now, Kalender's primary goal is to help us to persuade as marketers. But as project managers, we are marketing our projects and we are marketing our ideas all of the time. I have written two books on influence, a popular book on influence and a book on influencing stakeholders in times of change. And I really do wish that methods of persuasion had been available to me when I was researching these books. 
It is a fantastic contribution to my library of books on influence and persuasion and psychology in general. And if you want to get into the subject, it is a great book to start with. And Nick Kalender has a YouTube channel with some fantastic videos so you can find out a little bit more about his thinking before you decide to buy. I've got my books the wrong way around. Foolish, really, because if you read the Speed Reading book by Tony Buzzin, you'll get through all the other recommended books in half the time without losing any comprehension. Speed reading is an incredibly useful skill for project managers and any other professionals that have lots of reports and documents to read. In the first few chapters, it will actually double your reading speed just by eliminating some bad habits you've picked up, such as rereading previous sentences and notably subvocalization. Subvocalizing is the practice of hearing the words you're reading in your mind, which means you can only read as fast as you can generate that sound. Eliminating that habit will enable you to process written information incredibly fast. Unfortunately, I have a bad habit of backsliding on this skill. I'll read the book, apply it, improve, and then after a few years start to deteriorate until I pick up the book again and start the cycle again. So go and get yourself a copy because if you're anything like me, you're gonna need to read it more than once. The one consolation is you'll get faster at reading it each time. One last thing about this book. If you look on Amazon, you may find lots of versions of this book. When I looked, there was actually a version on there that was costing nearly 3,000 pounds. I have no idea why this version was so special, but it was being sold alongside a used version for 68 pence. Whether you get the current or an older version of the book, the techniques are exactly the same. So just get the cheapest, decent copy you can find. If you're a student, you may want to get the study skills handbook that summarizes speed reading, whilst also covering memory improvement tips, mind mapping, and some other very helpful tips for studying effectively. Now you've seen Mike and my recommendations for non-project management books, you should really head over to Mike's channel to see which project management books we've recommended. The link is in the description. Just remember to come back to this channel afterwards, please.